Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks everybody for coming. Today we have Zach Ross, and Zach got his PhD at uh, USC, and then he went and did a postdoc at Caltech, and I guess he did a really good job because they just kept him on as assistant professor. Uh, he actually overlapped with a couple of our faculty uh, while he was a grad student, so Amir and Kathleen, and then one little bit of trivia is that he actually went to the same high school uh, as Kathleen. And even though Zach is early in his career, he's already making a big impact. He's known uh, pretty widely for being an expert in artificial intelligence and machine learning and applying those kind of newer methods uh, to seismology and geophysics. And he's got his hands in just a, a ton of different things. And so today he's going to be telling us about uh, fault zones and, and their architecture. Uh, so Zach. Yeah. All right, um, so thanks for inviting me to come here. This is my first time at the university, so uh, it's pretty exciting. Okay, um, so, yeah, so the title of my talk, Structural Architecture of Fault Zones, and I'm going to try to make some connections back to earthquake physics. So um, earthquakes and faults are inherently coupled, and so fault zones are responsible for producing earthquakes, but each each earthquake in turn then changes the properties of the fault zones for the next event. Uh, most of what we know about fault zones comes from geology, and specifically this is information that's on the surface. Uh, what we know about fault zones below the surface is, is a lot less limited. So what do we know? Uh, so I have this map here, or this cartoon here uh, from Mitchell and Faulkner. Uh, basically, you have some principal slip surface like this that's highly localized. So this could be on the order of centimeters. Um, and within it, and surrounding this, you have this fault core. So the core is on the order of meters scale. Within it, you can have gouges, kind of clay sites, little kind of clay sites, and things like that. Um, and then I'm going to call these, uh, for this talk, just inner damage zones. So these are on the order of a few hundred meters wide. Um, and often, these, the, the density of, of rock damage is decaying exponentially away from uh, the fault core itself. We also see kind of evidence for distributed damage zones that are on the, on the order of kilometers scale wide, and these can often persist to, to significant depth. Um, and so with this picture here, it's kind of a little simplified. We, of course, you know, it's not just a single surface. Fault zones often have lots of different smaller cracks and faults that are embedded within them. Um, and it's important to really think of that. And so today, I'm, you know, historically there's been this view that faults are basically planes. Um, maybe for many of you that's not really the case, but uh, I'm hoping that you will leave this talk today with an appreciation for the, the 3D nature of fault zones. So um, here I'm showing you a, a cartoon from uh, this paper that came out a couple of years ago, which basically tries to classify different types of damage structures that, that we can see in the field and how they relate to uh, the tectonic set. So for example, over here um, we have this they call this a tip damage zone, which basically produces these kind of high angle cracks um, that come off the edge of this, this fault here that are in the extensional quadrant. Um, you can also see other types of these, they call these linking damage zones um, that are in between you know, some kind of step over region here. Um, or if you have two faults that are approaching each other, um, you can get different types of damage patterns here. So there's lots of different types of, um, of structures just within the damage that you can see. Um, and I think this is important for the physics of earthquakes. Now, below the surface, our knowledge is a lot more limited. And really, most of what we know comes from seismology. So um, so what do we know? Well, um, high resolution tomography studies like this one, uh, they show significantly reduced velocities um, near major faults. And these often persist down to something like seven kilometers or so. Um, we know that um, when you get close to faults, um, we often see um, phases like this that um, are produced from uh, essentially seismic waves getting trapped within very narrow, low velocity um, fault zone layers. And these layers are typically on the order of you know, one to 400 meters. Um, and they produce these types of resonance modes that show up after um, the S waves, which provide really important constraints on the width of the damage zone um, the shear rate velocity reduction within it, attenuation properties, and things like that. Uh, we also know that a number of faults have exhibited 
uh, these so-called uh, faults of head waves, which basically propagate along um, faults that have a, su a sufficiently strong material contrast across them, which tells us that um, the interface is actually sharp enough to produce these phases. So um, there's a variety of different things that we know and we see repeatedly, but we'd like to know more. And we can ask more generally, what are the structural properties of faults in cytogenic depths? This means the geometry, the phase velocity, uh, Q structure, velocity contrast, damage zone width, permeability structure, um, and how do these properties vary in space and time? Um, and we can also ask how these depend on the current state of a fault within its life cycle. So in terms of cumulative offset and slip rate, um, what are we seeing here? Uh, now, I would say in the last 20 years or so, there's become appreciable evidence for what I would call non-classical earthquake trigger mechanisms. And these I would, are, I'm thinking of in terms of, so for example, aseismic slip transients, we've now seen a number of these. This is down in the Salton Sea area of Southern California. And they tend to drive prolific sequences um, when they happen. So they, these are often swarm-like with migration properties to these sequences and so forth. Um, we also see a lot of evidence for fluid-related effects. And so in particular, um, so this is uh, in the Italian Apennines. And now there's been a number of very damaging sequences that have occurred there in the last 25, 30 years or so. And almost all of these seem to be related to some kind of high-pressure CO2 uh, at depth. And so obviously the permeability structure of these faults becomes very important. Um, and you know, so we can, we can ask more. We can say, what are the properties of these fault zones that could promote you know, a seismic subtransients like this? And how does the geometry of a fault zone facilitate fluid flow with the crust? Um, and if we know that fluids are going to be present, how do these processes enhance uh, the potential for triggering earthquakes? because that's very important for the physics of it. And in terms of earthquake physics, um, so here's a map of, uh, a global map of earthquakes, uh, basically 97 plus, where each earthquake is colored by this quantity here, which is the ratio of the radiated energy for the event divided by uh, the magnitude of the event to normalize it for scale. So we know that there is a global diversity of earthquake characteristics in terms of physical processes. Um, we see tsunami earthquakes that radiate very little energy. They tend to be relatively long period. Um, we see that, um, that there are events in the outer rise that produce very high frequency excitation. And we want to understand all of this. So clearly there must be properties of the faults themselves that are controlling this diversity um, that we're seeing. And so there's been a number of links between the properties of fault zones and the physics of earthquakes uh, throughout the years. Um, we know that earthquakes dynamically will dissipate energy as the ruptures propagate along the faults. Um, how dissipated these events are probably depends on um, how complex the faults are, the geometry of them, um, whether you're more likely to fracture rock as the rupture propagates and things like that. Um, we can measure uh, radiation efficiency, so basically how uh, dissipative a rupture is from seismology. We can also compare it to, um, to estimates from geology by looking at effectively uh, the amount of energy needed to create a fault gouge from intact rock. Um, and then if you average that over the total number of earthquake cycles um, on that fault zone, we can estimate the amount of energy that's being dissipated on average. Um, and so we have some sense of what those numbers are. We also know that um, properties of fault zones like low velocity layers can generate um, special phases within them, as I mentioned before, but these can be dynamic and can affect and interact with the earthquake rupture as it propagates. And so this can kind of modulate this process uh, in ways that is much more complex than we, I think, traditionally have been thinking about. There's also some theoretical studies that have shown that for faults like this, which have a more compliant medium on one side and a stiffer medium on the other, that in the direction of slip in the more compliant one, that um, there should basically be some kind of preferred rupture propagation direction. And so, um, you know, we can try to see whether this is a real effect or not and whether it's really important um, for the physics of Earth. So, um, Faults are essentially uh, structures that encode a long history within 
And so we can think of effectively a life cycle for a fault where basically you start out with some kind of distributed damage and cracking throughout a medium. Um, and if we combine this with increasing confining pressure with depth and uh, depth dependent healing, in, in a medium that's basically governed by a strain weakening rheology, you tend to localize strain. And particularly, you tend to localize it at depth more than you do at the surface. And so um, this tends to lead to what we think are these flower structures, um, which if you repeat this process over and over again over many different life cycles of the fall, you end up with something like this, um, where you basically have a mature fault zone, essentially. And so if these geometric and mechanical properties of the fall zone are evolving with time, um, and since you know these properties control the physics of earthquakes, are there expected effects on earthquake physics at different stages of these fault life cycles, and can we identify them in any kind of meaningful way? So um, I'm going to try to address some of these questions um, in my talk today. So to get started, uh, this is a map of Southern California. Um, so every black dot here is an earthquake that's occurred sometime in the last 20 years or so. In total, we have about 300,000 events. This is actually not quite present. Um, this is up to about the end of last year. but um, in general, if we look at the magnitudes that are associated with all of these events here, um, they, they look like this. And so if you plot this in a log scale here, um, we see this exponential uh, dependence on magnitude, or if you convert this into seismic moment, this is a power law scaling here. And so um, this power law basically starts to break start, starting around magnitude one or so. Um, and we believe for a variety of reasons that this is gonna keep going down to smaller and smaller magnitudes, which means that we're starting to miss events below about magnitude 1.7 to you know one and a half or so, depending on where you are within Southern California. And so um, we would like to do a better job at this. And obviously, you know, because of this power law scaling, if we can push this down in order uh, a magnitude unit, if the B value is one or, or the slope of this is one, it means that we're going to get something like 10 times as many events on average, which means the vast majority of the signal that we have to work with is really being missed altogether. Um, and I should mention that these events that we're missing are actually being recorded in the data. They just don't make it into the earthquake catalogs that we're producing. So we just need to do a much better job of finding all of these. So uh, starting around 10, 12 years ago or so, um, there was a technique uh, called the match filter algorithm or template matching a lot of people call it. Uh, that was introduced and it's really led to an explosion of new um, insights uh, into earthquakes as a result. And um, the way that this technique works is if you have two events that are basically uh, in the same location, um, even if their magnitudes are very different from each other, uh, within a certain frequency band, the idea is that the wave paths will be exactly the same to all the different um, seismic stations. And as a result, the waveforms that are recorded uh, will look nearly identical between those two events. And so if we have a big catalog of earthquakes, like we do for Southern California, we can take all of these past events and their seismograms and use them to define a set of template waveforms to scan all this continuous data and search for something that looks nearly similar. And so, um, so this is uh, this template matching algorithm. So here's some examples of templates here. So red um, waveforms here are P waves and blue are for S waves. And so these here are only a few seconds long. Um, and the idea is you take all of these waveforms, this is all for one event, and you cross-correlate it against all the continuous data. And so you get a big cross-correlation function that might be 24 hours long, and you repeat this for all of the stations in your seismic network. And you can then migrate each of these back in time by the travel time of the wave uh, for each uh, of these stations that you see here. And then you can just stack all these together, which produces something that looks like this. So this is basically cross-correlation as a function of time over a 24-hour period, which produces a big spike when there's basically a near-identical match at exactly the right points in time for every one of these phases across the entire seismic network. And so this template matching algorithm is extremely powerful. It's typically led to anywhere from five to 10 times as many events that were identified um, as with conventional techniques when you use it. Now the downside to it is that it's very computationally demanding. So cross-correlation like this requires lots of floating point arithmetic. And so um, typically most studies have been limited to something like a few weeks of data during a big aftershock sequence for maybe tens of seismic stations at a time. 
Um, and so uh, because of that, that led to a project that uh, I started at Caltech when I got there as a postdoc uh, about three years ago, which we called the, take the Quake Temple Magic Project. And so the goal of this was to apply uh, this template matching algorithm to the entire continuous waveform archive that we hold. And so this was for a period of 2008 to 2017. And it's basically going to be brute force cross correlation of every waveform with the entire data set across the board, which is a very uh, ambitious goal. Uh, in terms of computational time, this would be something like three to four orders of magnitude longer than anything that people had done previously. So um, a typical year of our data set has 450 seismic stations, but our network is kind of fluctuating in time. So um, sometimes we add stations, sometimes we remove them. Um, for this work, we use only broadband and short period sensors because all of our stations are co-located with uh, strong motion. So there's no real advantage uh, to using those there. And um, we're using 284,000 events that have been manually reviewed by humans over the last uh, 20 years uh, as template waveforms. And so um, to do these calculations, uh, we use an array of 200 NVIDIA P100 GPUs uh, for something like 300,000 GPU hours plus another million or more CPU hours to do this over many different iterations. So um, this was a major supercomputing effort to get this done. It's entirely data processing. Um, and it's in a lot of ways it's kind of surprising that it even worked out altogether. Um, so we published this work in Science back in April of this year, and so the catalog at this point is publicly available. It's available uh, through our, our Southern California Earthquake Data Center. Um, I encourage you to download it, use it, find new things um, about the Earth that, that we didn't know before. And so I'm going to now talk about some of the basic summary features of this data set, and then more specific applications. Okay, so um, in total, this effort resulted in 1.8 million earthquakes that were detected for that 10 year period, which is a 10 times increase across the entire catalog for that period over our, our standard um, real time catalog. So, on average, that means 500 events per day and an event every basically three minutes on average. Now, of course, during periods of you know, big sequences, this could be seconds apart continuously for weeks, or other times it could be a lot longer. But um, if you look at the magnitudes for these events, in red here um, are the magnitudes for our original catalog, which are basically complete down to, you know, magnitude 1.5 or a little less. Um, and the new catalog shown here in black basically gets down to the low magnitude zero range for the whole Southern California. Um, so here on the right hand side is basically event density in two by two kilometer boxes across the whole region. Uh, it's very heterogeneous in terms of the number of events. So this is just straight counts. Um, the central San Jacinto region over here uh, is by far the most active. And some of these little pixels here have more than 10,000 events apiece over this 10 year period. Um, and so it, it really is quite um, heterogeneous. And, uh, the temple matching, when you add in a factor of 10, it makes it that much more um, crazy than it is in the regular catalog. So um, so that's kind of the summary of this. We can zoom in on this area here, um, this most active part. And in total, this produces something like 20% of all the events uh, in Southern California. So OK, so we have another map of this area here and now this little blue box here. So um, this is called the trifurcation area of the San Jacinto Fault Zone, where it splits into these three strands. Um, and this is the seismicity colored by depth for this region in the original catalog that we started with. And so um, if we relocate all of our seismicity in our new catalog, it looks like this. And so you can see now that the whole internal fault structure pops out at you. So, we can see, for example, that this fault down here at depth has this curved geometry to it, merges probably back up with the central strand of the fault here. Um, we see these kind of broad damage zones that are distributed all around here. Um, we see some smaller uh, lineations in the seismicity here, as well as some orthogonal or cross-cutting structures. Some more of those over here, lots of off-fault stuff, 
um, over here. And so uh, we can look at this as a function of depth. So this profile is one I'm going to take across here for events that are basically within about five kilometers of it. And when you do this, um, again, you can see kind of all the structure of this here, uh, where we interpret this, this, and this as the three strands of the fault at depth. So we see, again, lots of rock damage distributed all the way down to even 15 kilometers here. Um, you can see lots of smaller faults and cracks that are kind of embedded within this region. Uh, the seismicity here is highly lineated, but it is dipping something like 70 degrees at depth. Um, and this is consistent with these focal mechanisms which are sliced um, through the plane of the cross section. So, um, so this here is looking at uh, the dip of this, of, of this fold. We can see then that if you extend this dip all the way up to the surface, that you would overshoot the surface traces of the fault by more than four, five kilometers. Um, which suggests that this whole system needs to undergo some kind of transition to a near vertical um, system, probably starting around eight kilometers or so. And indeed, there's some evidence for that here, where these lineations start to become more vertical. Also, in these focal mechanisms here and here, for example, um, that the dips are, are becoming steeper. So, um, so we believe that this is basically what the geometry of this fault system looks like here. Um, we. Uh, so there, there's basically kind of this hierarchical nature to the structure of this fault zone. Um, we know from a, an experiment of a linear array across this central Clark fault here um, that there is also some kind of shallow traffic structure that um, produces these phases here, these resonance modes that are trapped waves within a zone that's probably about 150 meters wide. Um, and so there's different types of damage related structures uh, throughout this area. Now, we can move to uh, the region that's just adjacent here, this hot springs section. Um, and again, it's kind of a bit of a cloud here. There's some evidence for some structures here. Um, but in our new catalog, you can see this a lot more clearly. And so you know, clearly, this uh, main Clark strand of the fault here, again, has some kind of curvature associated with it. Um, there's a width here that's probably about a kilometer or so wide to this zone. Um, which is larger than the nominal resolution of our locations, which is typically in the order of one to 200 meters. So um, we believe that this um, distributed nature here is genuine and that the, the fault itself is not perfectly localized in that area. You also see this kind of parallel set of structures all the way up here. Okay. So um, I kind of snuck this in here a little bit. It's, couple years outside of the, the technical endpoint of our catalog, but um, I basically took the same technique and I applied it to our recent Ridgecrest sequence, um, which is, you know, the most exciting sequence that we've had in California in now several decades. Um, so it's really exactly the same thing. We just took all the data for Ridgecrest in the first several weeks after the sequence. Um, it started on July 4th with this magnitude 6.44 shock. Um, even that was actually preceded it's hard to see here a little bit by a smaller foreshock sequence itself um, with about 40 smaller events that are close to about magnitude zero. Uh, 34 hours later, we had this magnitude 7.1 main shock. So uh, we thought this was the main shock at the time and we're telling this to the media. And then when a bigger one happened, well now all of a sudden that becomes the main shock according to our seismology nomenclature. So this is the largest sequence in California since Hector Mine in 99. Um, and so it occurred over here, um, which is uh, basically very close to Garlock Fault in Central California. Uh, so this is part of the Eastern California Shear Zone. Um, the, blue, the, the blue events here are those that were before the main shock, and the red ones are events that occurred after. It triggered a lot of stuff all over the place. Um, a, a big swarm up here at COSO, uh, which is one of the largest geothermal plants in the United States. Um, it triggered a swarm in this area here on the Garlock Fault itself, and another one up in Panamint Valley over here. Um, the entire fault network that ruptured here was unmapped and has a cumulative length of something like 75 plus kilometers. Um, it, a substantial portion of this rupture occurred uh, within the Naval Air Weapons Station uh, at China Lake. So that 
led to a lot of problems with getting access to the rupture. Um, and there's two fault zones. Uh, one is called the Little Lake Fault Zone, and the other one is the Airport Lake Fault Zone, which we're basically associating with these structures that rupture during the sequence. Um, okay, so what does this event look like? Uh, this is an interferogram um, for this event. Um, and basically, this, since this is rapid, these fringes are telling you ground deformation levels. And um, the more quickly the deformation is accumulating, the closer together the fringes are going to be. Um, we can see lots of structures here within this interferogram, um, and also a lot of stuff out here. Uh, on this right-hand side is a damage proxy map, which um, rather than producing this type of interferogram, basically looks for pixels that have decorrelated strongly um, with respect to uh, uh, an image that was taken before this earthquake. So you can see the geometry of this fault kind of has this undulating um, pattern to it. It bifurcates down here. Um, we see this long fault right here, which turns out ruptured during the magnitude 6 foreshock or one of the, event, the, the structures that did. Um, lots of other ones you can see around here. And all this stuff um, over here uh, basically looks to be related to liquefaction in this dry, surf like bed uh, in this area here. So the nearest big city was Ridgecrest. Um, and there wasn't actually a whole lot of damage that occurred there, surprisingly. But um, in this area here uh, is the Navy base, and there was like $5 billion worth of the damage that was caused there. And this facility was, is, is basically, you know, it's a classified type of facility, so they were actually very slow at recording how much damage had um, occurred there uh, initially. So, um, so we use this map to basically define the geometry of this fault network on the surface. And we can combine that with um, the seismicity of the sequence that I produced with this template matching algorithm. So here is the bulk mechanism for the main shock, the 7.1. Um, and this is the one for the, the four shocks. So um, the black lines are the, the surface trace uh, measured in the field. So we can see um, that in this portion of the fault that it's very localized. Um, and then once we get around here, there's all these orthogonal structures that are crossing it here. You can see this one really. Um, and then the fault bifurcates right here. So since we saw that on the surface too, these features persist over the entire um, seismogenic depth range. Um, there's lots of other stuff that's orthogonal if you look very carefully. And um, we can see this kind of horse tail faulting here. And if you remember from earlier in my presentation where I talk about the different types of damage structures that you see, in particular there's these kinds that you get the tips of fault zones, um, where you get these high angle structures that come out in the extensional quadrants. Um, the fact that you see this here probably suggests that this branch of the fault here has had multiple or, or quite a few ruptures on it in the past. The fact that we see all these orthogonal structures here but none up here might tell us that this part of the fault is further along in its evolutionary process. And that's because we believe that these kinds of uh, more complex structures tend to become relics um, as the fault zones evolve and you localize deformation more along um, individual interfaces like this. You also notice that this fault, this rupture here, stopped only about two kilometers from this major Garlock fault. And that's obviously a pretty significant concern because this whole fault here is only order 300 kilometers long. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty serious. Um, we can look at this in cross-section. In particular, I'm going to look at this one from A to A prime right here. Um, when we do this, um, we basically see evidence for more than 20 orthogonal faults that cut through this profile here. And so these are these lines here, I've, I've interpreted these. Um, if you're interested, I can show you the seismicity without them, but it looks relatively similar. Um, so there's some bigger ones and some smaller ones. And this one is pretty big. This one is basically this structure right here. And so it's, it's slightly dipping a little bit. Um, we see that the bottom of the cytogenic zone is basically about nine kilometers here, which is pretty shallow for, for Southern California. Um, that's probably related to the fact that COSO um, right here is, is a huge um, geothermal anomaly associated with it. And this is consistent with what we see, for example, in the Imperial Valley 
um, Southern California as well as some parts of the San Jacinto. Um, so it's pretty incredible that we see all these types of structures here. Um, and in terms of earthquake physics, um, you can imagine that when you have a big mesh like this, that um, if a rupture is you know, trying to propagate through it, it has all these different potential pathways that it can take. Whereas if you just have one continuous fault surface, um, it's harder to keep extending this, this rupture along that surface. So the physics of a rupture in kind of a mesh like this is going to be quite different, especially in terms of our estimates of rupture velocities, because it's not necessarily a single continuous rupture front that's propagating along the surface. You could have a rupture that starts and stops here, and then triggers another fault to fall like a domino effect type of thing, essentially. Um, so, you know, some questions are how a, a fault geometry like this can promote uh, multi-fault ruptures uh, to occur and what their, their impacts are. Um, we use a, a technique from seismology called sub-event modeling to um, reconstruct the, the source process for this sequence. So these colored lines here are um, basically um, a simplified version of the fault geometry. And they're colored according to which, fault, uh, which event we think that the fault broke in. And so um, in particular, we think that this set of red structures here, including this huge one that's orthogonal to these other ones, all ruptured uh, simultaneously during this magnitude 6. And the rest of these ruptured during the 7. And so um, our procedure basically solves for a few number of, of dominant sub-events that could occur uh, during this process. So uh, here you have, so this is E1 here, which has this beach ball. Um, and we think that the sequence initiated here first, so it ruptured this way. We then think it ruptured down here, and then jumped across and then ruptured all the way here. And so each of these beach balls, the color shading of it corresponds to um, this pulse here in the source type function, which basically tracks the moment rate um, over time. So this one has about a 10 second rupture duration. Um, and for the main shock, um, so we think that most of the moment comes from this big sub-event right here. So most of it is kind of bilateral. But there then is several, three other sub-events that rupture this way. And so this remainder of it is basically a unilateral rupture process. And so these are the sub-events that that correspond to, um, to this big one. And so you'll see here that um, this has a source duration of something like 22 seconds for this magnitude 7.1 earthquake. And given you know this length here, which is you know something like 60 kilometers long, basically gives you a very low rupture velocity um, on average across this entire sequence. And of course, as I mentioned before, if this is more of a mesh-like fault network, that average velocity could be quite biased from what's locally happening at any point along this fault itself. So, um, so that's kind of a sneak peek for this sequence. Um, we have a paper coming out in a few weeks that talks about this in a more detail. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump to a different sequence here um, that we call the Kauia swarm that's been going on since 2016. Um, so this is occurring here, which is in between uh, the San Jacinto and um, the Elsinore Faults, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And this is basically just granite here. There's really nothing special about this area. Um, but in terms of seismic activity, it's been very, very active, starting here in early 2016, and then just starting to ramp up activity slowly over several years. Um, and so this sequence produced something like 15% of all of the events in our catalog um, over the last three years or so. So it's really quite substantial in that activity. Uh, starting at this point here, we had a change in the behavior, which coincided with a magnitude 4.4. That was the largest event in the whole sequence, which completely changed, accelerated the seismicity rate, but then also induced kind of this decay at the same time. So now, by this point, it pretty much seems to have nearly come to an end. Um, we can look at the seismicity for this sequence here uh, after we relocate the whole thing. Um, and so here, uh, these events are colored by the depth. 
So the range here is something like four to um, maybe six kilometers or so at the deepest, so a little less than six. Um, we can see this clean gradient of color here, which tells us that this fault zone is dipping. Um, we can see kind of individual channels that are composing this seismicity here. Um, and so what's really amazing is that if we now plot this on this side, colored by time, we can basically trace the origin of this swarm back to a zone um, that's on the order of a few hundred meters wide. And so you can see then that this swarm is moving up and into here and down and into here, but it stops. And then it starts to move up into a different area and stops. And then it starts to move up here and then stops. And so it's slowly pushing through different areas um, of this system here. And um, so there's basic, the fact that you can see this very clean pattern over the whole sequence basically tells you that there's some kind of front that's expanding continuously. And we don't really see any evidence of earthquake triggering ahead of this front. So in terms of the physics and what's going on here, it really looks like there's some kind of very localized interactions um, that are either at that front or behind it. So if this is fluid related, which we think that it is, um, that it's basically moving through this fault network and probably breaking open um, structures that have been sealed shut for quite some time. And this is a really slow migration velocity. But these dimensions here, are, you know, this is a kilometer, and you're talking about over a three-year time period. So it's really slowly moving. We can look at this in some cross sections. And so here we have these different profiles, um, A, B, C, and D. This is the magnitude 4.4 that I was talking about earlier, so it happened right now here. And we can see, um, again, there's this kind of curved geometry that's really dipping um, at the northwest uh, end here. It starts to straighten out a bit more in this area um, and so forth. But it's kind of, you know, kind of twisting to some degree. Uh, in 3D space here. And so, you know, the width of this structure here reduces to something that's on the order of, you know, 50 to 100 meters wide, and that's basically the resolution of our, of our location. So this is really quite sharp, um, and probably is the extent of the fault system uh, in this area. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the extent of what I'm going to talk about in terms of Southern California. Um, I want to also fit in this one last part on uh, a completely different area. This is in Japan, but I think it's really interesting and, and closely related to all these other parts that I've been talking about. Um, and so we're going to go all the way to, to basically southwest Honshu in Japan here. Um, in this area on the northern shore, which has been given this name, uh, the Sanin Shear Zone where there's this kind of belt of seismicity going across it. Um, and it's basically a very young fault zone that's being formed right now. Um, much younger than the stuff that we're basically seeing in, in most of these California faults that I've, I've been talking about. Um, so this is intraplate. It's got a very low rate of strain accumulation, but it's had a number of very large events somehow still in the last century. So there's this one here back in 1943, which was a magnitude 7. Um, we had this one in 2000, which is a magnitude 6.7, and this is a big aftershock sequence of that. Um, and then most recently, we had this in 2016, um, which is a magnitude 6.2. So this Totori uh, prefecture here um, is quite remarkable because even though it has all this stuff here, uh, the geologists that have looked at this area have found no evidence at all of active faulting on the surface, and, and they've tried. <laughs> so. Um, so somehow there's these processes that are occurring at depth, but somehow have not made up to uh, the surface, it looks like, just yet. And that's going to be something I get back to uh, very soon. So if we look at um, the sequence for this 2016 event that I mentioned, um, after applying our detection technique and relocating all the seismicity, it reduces to something like this. Um, so here I'm coloring the events uh, like this. Um, so it's basically everything below eight kilometers is red, and or above eight kilometers is red, and below it is black. So of the red ones, um, well, what do we see? 
there is lots more diffuse nature to all this. It's a lot more complicated in the shallow structure. Lots more segmentation, branching, um, all this off-fault stuff over here, over here. Um, most of this even has these lineations in it that are trending northwest, which are consistent with the overall focal mechanisms of this sequence in this area. And if we look at the deeper ones, which are colored black, they are much more localized. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. So we can look at this in cross-section. So here, this one is fault normal. Um, this way here, and this one is fault parallel, like this. So we can see um, that kind of the width of the fault zone in the shallow structure down to about eight plus kilometers localizes quite a bit um, as it goes deeper. Something like a reduction of maybe two to, to four times depending on where you're looking at here. You also see all this other stuff up here which we don't really know what those structures are. <coughs> now in the fault parallel view, um, so this is the hypocenter here, and we have this big ring-like structure um, around it. So all these big clouds kind of up here. And so um, what is this? looks kind of ominous. Um, it turns out that if you invert the tide data for the slip distribution, that it basically fills this big ring here. Um, but what's interesting is that, number one, this is actually very compact spatially, uh, which for its size puts it at very large, um, large slip value. So you're looking at basically four meters uh, at depth of measure this stuff. And because of that, um, if you try to calculate the static um, stress drop for this event, we estimate that it's something like 18 to 27 megapascals, which is pretty high. Um, we can also estimate um, the amount of energy that was radiated during this event, and, and we put that number at basically 10 to the 13 joules. Um, and if you see here, that basically all of the slip in this event occurs deeper than 8 kilometers. And, and why is that? Um, so I mentioned before that there's, there's this history of events in this area, um, of large events. There is no evidence of, of active faulting from surficial expressions. Um, and it turns out that this is not the only one that didn't come close to the surface. The 2000 event, which is even larger than this, 6.7, um, it stopped something like several kilometers from reaching the surface. And the 1943 one was Mechanic 7, um, only ruptured the surface in a couple of very um, sparse locations and everything else um, it did not. And so, um, so given the fact that this is a very young fault zone, um, we now have a history of, of three pretty significant events that basically produced little to no surface break here. Um, is it possible that the vertical extent of these rupture processes is being limited because the fault structure does not actually extend all the way to the surface. Um, and if we think back to this model that I had of the life cycle of a fault zone, where you basically start off with distributed deformation, and because you have this depth-dependent healing effect, you're going to localize first at depth before you localize at the surface. And so if this is very early on in the life cycle of a fault zone, we might expect that at depth, it's really only localized over this area here and at the shallow structure that all the deformation is being accommodated in kind of distributed cracking and that kind of thing. And that maybe over time, this upper end of the fault zone can keep pushing up more and more and localizing and eventually rip through the entire, um, through the entire cross. Um, so I, I don't know, but uh, I think it's an interesting question. So how does this event compare to the other end member case? So if this is a very, very young fault zone, what if we look at one that's a completely mature fault? So we can take this Parkfield event, which is in 2004, magnitude 6, so it's slightly smaller than this one, which is 6.2. Um, and we can compare the physical attributes of the ruptures for these events. So here we have this Votori event, and here we have Parkfield. And so for Totori, the rupture length is like six kilometers about. For Parkfield, it's like 20 kilometers. Okay? So this one is much smaller, it's smaller, and 
corruption length is more than a factor of three larger. But it turned out in terms of the radiant energy, um, we basically found that they're almost identical. They're basically five times 10 to the 13 joule. And so since these rupture lengths are so different, um, but the size is not too far apart, that means that um, the stress drop for Clitori is about a factor of 10 times larger than this part filled event. So what does this mean? How can we kind of reconcile this and understand this in terms of the physics here? Um, we calculate this quantity called radiation efficiency, which basically tells you that the, the fraction of the available strain energy that goes into rupture, the available strain energy for rupture propagation that goes into um, seismic wave radiation. And so here we have the radiated energy over the change in, um, in strain energy. And we can calculate this by taking this radiated energy value and dividing it basically by the stress drop scaled by the seismic moment of the earthquake. And what this tells us is that um, because the radiated energy is the same, but the stress drop is 10 times larger, that for this Clitori earthquake, that something like only five to seven percent of all the available strain energy was radiated at seismic waves. Whereas for this one here, um, it's 10 times larger, so much more efficient in radiating energy. Um, and so if we go back again to these two cases here, this is a very young fault zone. This is a very mature fault zone, much more localized. Are these very dramatic differences here due to the fact that young fault zones are much more dissipative in terms of energy release? Um, is all the geometric complexity and the heterogeneity and off-fault cracking and things like that affecting this seismic energy budget? So, in summary, this event is basically 10 times more dissipative uh, than this very mature event on the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so um, we've done a, I've shown you a lot of different things with this technique, some template matching. Um, it's pretty, the results are pretty incredible in terms of how many events it's able to recover, 10 times more on average. And that might give you the impression that this technique has no um, limitations to it. But in particular, there is one limitation of this technique that is not so satisfactory. And that's because since we use the seismograms of previously reported earthquakes to search for new earthquakes, that this template matching algorithm is basically blind to scenarios that we haven't seen before. And so um, this means that, number one, you can't use this technique if you, have, if you don't have an earthquake catalog to start with. If you collect new data, how do you even build that catalog in the first place to use this template matching algorithm? Um, and what are the biases potentially about our catalog? Well, first of all, um, I don't think that for us this is a major issue because we've used 20 years worth of seismicity across all of California um, to use our to define our template set, and so we think that most likely there's probably not too much seismicity out here that we're missing. And if it is some, it's probably not a significant fraction of the total now. Now, I can't obviously prove that because I don't know it, but um, we seem to think that that's a pretty reasonable assumption to be making. But ideally, we would have a technique that has the sensitivity of all of this or something comparable to it, but does not have this blind spot. So that if you have data that's brand new, you've never detected an earthquake there before, you could be able to process that from scratch and start this whole machinery. And so, um, to basically wrap this up here, um, in recent years, there has been truly stunning progress in the field of artificial intelligence, particularly in the area of deep learning. And so, um, in 2012, um, the world was changed forever because deep learning was shown to uh, essentially outperform all sorts of other models uh, of statistical learning. And that has led to a completely revolutionary, to changes throughout all of our lives, even when we don't realize it. So today, if you call Uber, how do you decide, how do they decide which car to send you? Well, it's an AI algorithm that does that. How do they decide how much to charge you? It's an AI algorithm that decides that. 
you go to Google and you try to translate a sentence into another sentence, it's an AI algorithm that decides how to translate that stuff. So all these things that we're working with in our daily lives today are already being controlled by uh, deep learning and these artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, so we have developed a framework that basically translates this technology into seismology. Um, and the idea is that we have this massive data set of manually <coughs> labeled phases for nearly a century in Caltech. Humans go, they look at the data, they measure the phases, they measure the arrival times. We have this massive data set. And we can take these algorithms and use them to develop a single model that generalizes this entire body of knowledge such that if you now show me some new data like this that I've never seen before, it knows how to recognize the generalized characteristics of seismic waves, how they propagate, their particle motion, all this stuff. Um, and it's, we, we, we've had really some exciting successes with it. And so you're able to take a model, for example, trained in Southern California, you can port it to Japan, you can apply it to active source explosions. Um, and the picking <coughs> performance of this in terms of measuring these arrival times basically is at or better than the capabilities of human experts. <coughs> so this has the potential to propagate all the analyses that we do downstream, which means locating earthquakes, which affects the seismic tomography study, which affects the source property study, which affects all this stuff um, that seismologists care about. So um, if you want to hear more about this, I have a talk in detail on it tomorrow, um, but that's the CP. So um, to wrap this up, hopefully I've been able to show you that fault zones are very three-dimensional. They're continuously evolving. They span different length scales. Uh, their geometric and mechanical properties influence the energy dissipation, the rupture velocity, fluid flow, dimensions, and many, many, many other things. Uh, these factors probably therefore depend on the current state of the fault in terms of how mature it is. Um, high resolution seismicity catalogs from this temple matching -like algorithm can provide excellent constraints on the structure of faults and the depth. Um, I put a, a shout out here for our catalog, which is available through the Southern California Big Data Center, and it has 1.5 million earthquakes in it. And um, I think the future of this is with these artificial intelligence algorithms that are going to overcome these limitations that we've experienced with this catalog, and come see me tomorrow. Thank you.